Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Functional Fitness and Physiology Podcast. My name is Andy and I'm your host. I am an exercise physiologist and strength and conditioning coach, so I look at a lot of the advice given through a different lens. With that being said, everything that you listen to in our discussions is not meant to be sound medical advice or does it supersede the prescriptions given to you by your practitioner. I hope these podcasts help you hold deeper conversations with your medical practitioner, personal trainer, or whoever just happens to be your guru at the time in helping you, again, you, obtain a better quality of life. Hey, Andy, can you hear, hear me? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I can. All right, good, good. Okay. Yeah, I can even see you. Can you see me? I certainly can. Hey, man, that's a win. I finally got it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, All right, well, nice to meet you. Likewise, likewise. How's your day going? Uh, you know, it's Florida, Florida, beautiful, man. Weather, weather's beautiful. Have a good little workout, a little sun, a little cut the lawn. Can't complain, you know? Oh, I hear you. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, yeah. Can't say I'm not jealous. <laughs> well, you kind of have the same, right? Almost. It's a lot more. It's a lot more muggy than it yeah. is nice. Um, yeah. South Carolina is very notorious for it being 30 degrees, 32 degrees, 84 degrees, right. and then right. back to 40 degrees. And so it, it really messes a lot with our sinuses and. Uh, you, you may even hear me cough a bunch of times today because it's uh, there's a lot of pollen out. Come to find out. Yeah, same here. Yep, same here. And I was out there in the uh, well, I'll call it a little jungle here. We went mountain biking yesterday for a few hours. So yeah, all that pollen and stuff out, out there. And the, you know what I would say, crazy. You know, Florida wild. Got a kind of took toll. That's for sure. A little sneezing here. Yeah. Yeah. Well. But at least you got that nice sea breeze to kind of draw it and pull it out. Man, yeah. can't beat it. Can't yeah. beat it. It's beautiful you, here. You really Gotta can't. No, I uh, know. I guess kind of teetering into our conversation, I noticed that uh, EXOS, you familiar with them? EXOS? Yes. Very their institute. So. And uh, yeah. they have one close to you in, what is it, Land of Lakes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I applied for a job about two months ago so hopefully if they're watching or listening to this and hey my name's andy and we're about to talk about tactical strength and conditioning stuff so uh well good luck man yeah man, man that'd be great yeah be hey, in the about area. an hour away yeah. yeah they will definitely have to connect my uh my wife she she lived in clearwater for a little over a year when she was getting her massage therapy it was a little bit more involved in uh like a certification or anything, but she she went to a school there back in 2000, 2001. Man, right down the always, road. Always talks about being in Clearwater. So it's a, uh, I guess you could say it's on the bucket list. Don't blame you. Yeah, yeah so things have changed since then, you know, here, but uh, you can imagine. it's blown up quite a bit. But uh, yeah, it's, well, it's our final resting spot. Put it that way. I'm nice. not going anywhere for any reason. Yeah. So yeah, we're loving it. When the kids are grown, I got one that's seven. He's our youngest. And he's he's the one that has all the athletic potential. So uh, ah, good for you. Once he turns 17 or 18, got all these colleges or probably even the military looking at him. I think Tampa is going to be the, the next stop. But Yeah, well, let's stop talking about Tampa because, you know, it's driving that. a bunch of people here, man. And I just, you know, enough. Tampa sucks. Don't think about coming <laughs> here. There's no good reason. The weather's horrible. The beaches are just a mess. Yeah, don't come here. I heard the people are horrible, too. So oh, man, man yeah, it's man. horrible. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, nothing good here, you know? Right, no good uh, pizza. And, yeah, I, I don't want to talk bad about that. Being a New Yorker, we finally found a place that's actually very good. So, yeah. I understand. We'll, we'll leave it at that, though, yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, before we get into the deep dive here, why don't we go into talking about who Michael, is it Yatsko? Is that yes. how you say that? Yatsko? Yeah. Uh, who yeah. Michael Yatsko is, where he's come from, and how you got into the industry. Well, long story, you know, uh, athlete gro- growing up, a um, little bit of teamwork here and there, you know, but uh, more more of the fighting martial arts type of stuff. Uh, went straight into the military at a high school. You know, spent a few years there, 
um, kind of coaching even at that point, to be honest with you. You, you know, in military, you were prior military. So once you make E3, E4, you have some skills, you kind of start sharing this. And that's really where my coaching started. Um, did about eight years altogether active duty and then got out. And, you know, I was going to school and, and ended up with the uh, police. That was my next goal. Um, so I ended up in Phoenix Police Department for, well, which ended up almost 25 years. But uh, even while there, you know, I went to school full time. I, you know, went through my exercise science, continued on to master's program. You know, the entire time, though, every no matter what we did, it seemed like I was always kind of the coach. Um, whether it was at the weight room, uh, on the mountain, doing mountain biking, out on the trails, doing running, uh, you know, wherever we were, uh, even in the gym fighting, you know, in the, in the mixed martial arts, although I was never the leader there for sure. But, uh, you know, always involved with that. And uh, that's pretty much where I'm. Not got my start, but man, it's just been grind for you know better part of 35 years now at this point, and I continue to do it. Not so much the fighting anymore, you know that's that's kind of gone. You definitely call me coach now. I'm not sparring with anybody, you know. I'm not putting my mouthpiece in for anybody. That that's done, and that's promised to the wife, you know. But I still teach boxing or, or kickboxing once a week, and you know, staying active with a little bit of everything. You know? So that's that in a nutshell. Well, that's, that's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. When you have people of substance and especially in our career field that you, you either, and you're probably, a, you know, seen this trend too, where we get our bachelor's degrees and we, we get these undergraduate degrees. We're with a group of people that probably less than 15% end up going into a master's degree, pursuing a higher level of it. Uh, where a lot of us tend to either go into the the training industry or another industry altogether. And so it's nice to see professionals such as you that took the undergrad and it sounds like you're an enlisted man too. So, you know, you used to work for a living with uh, taking that be no do. And it's a bit of an old army philosophy where you, you, you be the example right? You, you have to practice it. You got to do it. And you have to turn it into something that's tangible. And then you're, you're developing that subject matter knowledge. So there, there's a, a, a tactile learning relationship that goes into with the exercise science program, becoming a coach and becoming, uh, you know, that exercise practitioner that I always like to preach. I am with that background. So I got your LinkedIn pulled up here with, uh, you know, looking at what you are and what you're doing now. And it seems like you've come around full circle into, uh, you know, going from that military background, turning it into a long-term career, even though I would say it's kind of like a lot of people at face value will say that you sidestep went from the military into the police force. But to me, that sounds like a logical transition anyways, where a lot of the same behaviors and a lot of the same schedules you know, correlate well. So talk to me about being the director of ta or yeah, director of tactical athletic performance at the Tampa sports Academy. Well, I appreciate you mentioning them for sure. Uh, that came about by, you know, when I, when I, we moved over to this side of the country, you know, this is kind of our final retirement spot. Um, you know, there's no giving up. You can't just stop doing stuff, you know? Um, and it's just kind of one of my ways to, to I hate to say this term, but give back, you know, uh, I've been given so much through this entire, my entire career whether it was military, fire, police, whoever it was. So, you know, I looked around here and I was trying to find a place that I could fit in and I could go in, train, still be kind of somewhat relevant, you know, see if I could volunteer and found out, even though I'm right down the street from SOCOM, which is Special Operations mm -hmm. Command, they don't have anything. You know, there was nothing. And you mentioned Clearwater and there was a great facility there. And I said, well, I'll start it up here then. You know, I'll get it going. I'll get in there and start training with people and kind of get my name around and, you know, get the coaching up a little bit and then we'll, we'll blow it up. Well, they didn't quite have that same mentality. So I had to travel, unfortunately, to South Tampa, which is, a, you know, near an hour with traffic, um, but well worth it. It's right outside the gate of, of uh, McDill Air Force Base, which houses SOCOM. And uh, clearly there's a lot of military folks there, a lot of retirees. Uh, there's a lot of fire police. So you talk about first responders, it's saturated in that area. And and to that, I would include 
um, nurses, doctors, uh, dispatchers, of course, you know, most under, uh, I would say underserved is probably just, it's amazing. They get nothing, you know? So uh, yeah, we take them on as well. But anyway, I, you know, I went to the owners and it just happened that the owners, and I did my homework, of course, but the owners were prior military, two of them were, two osteo uh, docs from SOCOM. So they came straight from there, opened up this facility. Another one is a federal law enforcement officer. So, you know, of course, there's, a, there's that commonality. And then one was a professional football player. Like, well, it was kind of the best of all worlds. I went downstairs. You know, I was looking to develop a, a complete human performance program. I went downstairs. They took me through the physical therapy section, very pro-police, pro pro-military, uh, of course. I looked around. Three-quarters of the pe people in there were military. I'm like, all right, we're getting there. Uh, talked to the ATCs, and, you know, they were all like-minded, performance-based. And I actually went and talked to the yoga person, and, and she's taking on military left and right. You know, 75% of her clients were at the time. Um, same thing with the massage therapist there, you know. So they were all like-minded. And I thought, wow, this is a nice 20,000-foot uh, facility that is based in performance. You know, you didn't see a bicep curl there. Uh, all right, I'm home at home with that and with the folks. So I started breaking it down and uh, developed this division uh, together and worked through it. And as soon as we got it up and running, COVID hit. So yeah, just as soon as we got it up and running, you know, we had probably five, six athletes coming in. Um, so of course, you know what happened there. Things got shut down a little bit, but, uh, but we're coming back now. So it's, it's, it's coming around. Yeah, it's coming full circle. So we're, we're, on, the, we're on the climb back up. Good. Good. Uh, before I forget, just go ahead and uh, throw a little pitch into it. See, uh, you know, if anybody's listening to this that lives around the Tampa Bay area, how would they get in contact? Who are you serving and how can, uh, how can they get involved with your program? Uh, pretty easy. Uh, they can look us up online, Tampa Sports Academy, or they could come down and see us. It's on uh, 4539 South Dale Mabry, Avenue, uh, Dale Mabry Highbury, Highway, which is uh, – like I said, just up the street from McDill Air Force Base. So South Tampa, look us up online, give us a call, whatever you want to do. There is, this is a very special division. Um, so all they have to do is mention the TAPT program, which is Tactical Athlete Performance Division, and they'll be forwarded to the right person for there. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for that. Hey, no worries. I mean, it's a, doing podcasts, this is technically, if it goes all the way through, will be my third episode, so... Uh, I've been working oh, on. Congratulations! Yeah, thanks. I've been working on this. Uh, it's been really slow to to launch kind of deal, where uh, anybody's heard my spiel before. I'm a bit of a dual method guy, where I originally went into the clinical exercise world and started progressing and developing a network and getting the experience there. But you know, and I think we'll end up talking about politics here in a little while, anyways, with the idea of funding and. With the clinical society, there's a lot of uh, what's good confusion that does with when we explain how we do things and how we exercise physiologists integrate in the clinical world, uh, and that becomes a bit of a, a I don't want to call it a moot argument, but there, there's still a lack of uh, understanding as to the clinical exercise physiologist. So my second master's had to do with human performance nutrition and because a lot of my undergraduate work was still heavily rooted in strength and conditioning, I was able to kind of leverage a lot of that to, you know, pursue my uh, current contract with the uh, South Carolina Air National Guard. And, you know, here I am again, and it's a, uh, it's contract bidding season. So, yeah. All right. Uh, but that's, that's a little bit about my background for your context, but with uh, understanding the, the notion of, getting contracts and getting into the, the tactical world. You know, I like the way how you also integrated the emergency medicine society there. So when we talk about, when I define a tactical athlete, yeah, the, the common denominator is always going to be the active military world. But right. then we talk about emergency responders. So you got your police officers, your SWAT guys, your firefighters and your fire and rescue, your para paramedics and your EMTs. Um, and so we're trying to integrate all of these high pace, underpaid jobs 
into a high demand world. And that's where I guess guys like you and I are really trying to, there, there's no real true expert with what we're doing. I, I think we talked about yeah. that briefly. All right. And there's some really smart guys doing some amazing work out there. Uh, Brandon Roberts, Dr. Brandon Roberts is also a captain in the National Guard. Uh, I, I follow him quite a bit in his research and right now, because the transgender ban was lifted, we are now having to integrate that back into the tactical world. There, we can go on to that on a whole nother podcast, but let, let's get back into the framework of being that subject matter expert and um, what, I like how you also mentioned that doing what you do is still you continuing to serve. You know, I, I was talking to my contract officer about three weeks ago when they informed me that the contract wasn't going to get renewed. It was a great opportunity and I loved being with the, with the group because I got medically separated. I was no longer deployable. So they gave me the option to change jobs or get out. And because I always watched GI Joe growing up, that was the only thing I wanted to do. So this was an opportunity and this is still continuing to be an opportunity for me, an old army grunt, to continue to serve my country by helping others be more proficient and effective in their job. So let's talk about how you've integrated into the, the, the technical society or tactical society here. Well, let's, you know, narrow the focus back to the operator, the, you know, the, the guys that kind of perpetuated our career field as uh, tactical strength and conditioning guys. So like your SOCON, your, you know, your Navy SEALs, your force recon, I don't think they're called force recon anymore, but All right. uh, like our pararescue and our rangers. Well, for me, I mean, it started when I was active. Um, you know, I had, I was fortunate enough to go through a couple of different pipelines. So, you know, they gave me a good taste of, you know, actually our unpreparedness and how our tra training was actually not to my level, what I was expecting for sure. I mean, think back, I'm showing my age here, but you know, early eighties, all we did was run and push-ups. you know, it was all relative strength, you know, and that's it. Um, good, right? I mean, good. We're in, you know, fantastic shape. We're all lean, you know, but, you know, there's no way we're kicking the door open up a Humvee that's been rolled over. You know, there's no way we're going to pick up two 40 pound ammo cans and, you know, run down the street. You know, you, you're, you're, you'll have, it's a hard task. You know, strength training was uncommon and un, un, unthought of, you know, not thought of at all. You know, it was actually looked down upon. So, um, <clears throat> again show my history there thank god in the mid 90s we started kind of catching on to this and i think believe it or not looking at the history of things in my career in particular the police were probably i'd say second in line but before the military to recognize this um they never tested it not that i'm a no not that i'm aware of and if they did um it was probably not validated type testing anyway we're well known for that um, police departments, I'm sorry, not police departments, fire departments are actually the ones that really started giving it a go. And I think in the private sector, the fire departments really did a much better job than anybody else. Eventually, of course, the military caught on and, you know, and, and you got to give a lot of credit for AF, AFSOC and, and Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs are the ones that name recognition for sure. And, you know, they did a fantastic job just revamping their entire program, you know. But we had to, you know, when you're not recruiting as many folks and you're having the washout rate that they were having, well, what can we change to make them, you know, more durable? And that's what they were looking for. And that's where I think one of the smartest things they ever did is not just keeping it to themselves, like so many of the other, you know, police department would keep it to themselves, fire department would keep it to themselves, army would keep it to themselves, you know, Navy SEALs actually came out and started sharing this. And I think... And you could probably correct me on this, but I'm pretty sure they were the first ones to start hiring on actual strength and conditioning coaches, not an E6 with, you know, 11 years of experience and, and no offense to anybody, but just because they were a SEAL doesn't make you a better coach, you know? So just, just like pro football, right? You get a bunch of old players that are coaches now that really aren't coaches, you know, not to take away from their experience and time on the field. That's, you know, priceless, of course. But do they really get the energy systems? You know, do they actually know what three range of emotions are? You know, they don't. So we have to make sure that that the education is followed up on that. The si everything is science based, science based. 
And that's what the Navy SEALs really brought in. And uh, I think once that caught on, once it became popular, now you look at Navy SEALs everything, right? Any news channel you watch at Navy SEALs, you know, and I say thank God for them because they brought it to the forefront. They get and all even, the movies too. Yeah, they get the cool equipment too, apparently. I know. Yeah, I was out in San Diego for a couple of years, so I got to play with them a little bit, and it's, it's amazing, you know, but they're, they were brilliant and, and sharing this, and it really started a culture. And I say it really ignited it right around 2008 or so. I was already a head strength and conditioning coach over at Phoenix by then. Um, we had a great department. They actually, you know, they actually pushed us even, God, as far back as I can remember, we had a, a physical fitness coordinator in the department. And that's really where I got the bulk of my experience working with different aspects of police and then start sharing it with, with fire. Um, I already had the foundation in, from the military, but uh, I'd say it was a, unstable foundation at the, at, at, at the, at best, you know, because of just simply looking at the relative and endurance portion of it. So, um, it's been a 35, 40 year career of, of collecting all of this information, um, validating some of as you can, as much as you can. And NSCA did a great job with their TSAC when they started culminating other coaches, you know, more towards the tactical population it really helped those of us that were one-offs. You know, at the time I started, there were two CSCS uh, police officers in the, na uh, in the nation at the time that were actively doing something. And it was myself and somebody up in uh, Minnesota. So, I mean, it really brought a lot of validity to, to the specialty, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. You, you talked about specificity, right? <laughs> back in the, when you said back in the 80s, it was all run and push-ups and relative strength. That, that concept really hasn't changed much. Um, I know right now the Army and the Navy and the Air Force are, not Air Force, but the Marines are looking at changing their PT structure, their physical training, the way how they conduct exercises in the morning. But that's still being tested and validated across the nation. I'm waiting to see how that works here in South Carolina. I'm right up the street from USC and talked to a couple of guys out there and they're, they're you know, doctoral level students are doing some jam up work there. However, there still goes back to the rule of specificity, right? The said principle. Yep. And I would probably, dare I say, it is the most important principle when it comes to, you know, taking the fundamentals of strength conditioning, right? The, the CSCS is a wealth of knowledge and it is a, a, a great starting and jumping off educational uh, springboard, I guess you could say. But when we're translating that information to the tactical world, a lot of it doesn't carry over. You know, and that on top of trying to show commanders that, yeah, we're, we're about to go into a combat, direct combat scenario, CQB, close combat quarters or close quarter combat. And running two miles is not the same as sprinting 30 yards. Correct. You know, they're both ambulatory exercises, but they're not the same. All right. So talk to me more about that. And I know you you. You know, you got some really good uh, vocabulary there when you mentioned energy systems. So that, that's kind of more of what I'm interested in with this question. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to consider everything, right? And, and every, I mean, I hate to break it down this basic, but every tactical athlete is a specific person, you know? So, of course, everybody has a specialty. You know, you may be type 2B, you know, type 2B in the military, you know, they're going to be crashing down some doors if they're in the right job, right? So easy teach, you know, to, to get them up on strength and power, you know, pretty easy. But if they're a type one, you know, and they're pure endo, I mean, it's tough to get them to a certain level of strength level that I think is acceptable. I have my own standards there. I created them. They are so subjective. It's crazy. Um, I actually just wrote an article for Fire, uh, for Fire magazine about this. I'm going to get a lot of pushback from this. But as we just talked about, I am the player that played for 35 years, and now I'm the coach. But there is a difference that theoretical and practical in my world came together through education. And that is where I close the gaps. And it's not just me. It's, it's all of us that are doing this. We take the theoretical that we're taught in, in academics. You know, this is why we keep going back. You know, I also have two master's degrees. I wasn't satisfied with the first one, just to it. I wanted to add a little bit more. So I went back and I got another one, you know, and I closed that theoretical gap as best as possible 
with zero assistance from anybody, really. You just have to do it because you're, you've been in the job for 25 years. You know what it takes. Here's the standard of strength that we actually need. Nobody ever talked about this before. You mean you got to work out with weights? Yeah, you have to actually train strength training. You know, th this is a foreign concept apparently, you know, and it's finally getting, you know, catching on a little bit. But, man, to close that gap between the theoretical and practical, it's a big commitment. And, you know, I know that I know how it works with, with some of these agencies. Um, you know, hey, sign on. We'll give you six months. You come with us and you'll be a strength conditioning uh, coach for six months. Not a whole lot of impact. You know, you may get a couple out of there, you know, but it takes years of kind of cutting through the red tape to get that, you know, to make an actual impact in a single department or a single uh, battalion, you know, whatever, wherever you are. You know, it takes a long time. It's a, it's a very difficult climb for sure. So as you said, you were with the South Carolina uh, Air, was it Army National Guard? It's the Air, Air National Air Guard. National so I work Guard. with uh, F-16 fighter pilots. Yeah, so even harder, right? But, uh, you know, because you may not need a full complement of all of those, um, the variables for, you know, of course, strength, you know, anaerobic conditioning, aerobic conditioning. Um, I see you would, but, you know, they're seated most of the time. So it's, it's a different, different type of impact. However, you know, regardless, they're still a TAC officer. So should the plane go down and they have to survive, they have to be ready for that. Um, running to the plane, you know, it's a little different than running out five miles. So I get it, you know, but we have to take all these variables with each individual, do an individual assessment because no grunt, no 11 Bravo is the same as an old 311, you know, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. They're all a little bit different. So, you know, um, some carry heavy, heavy loads, some are light fighters. You have to take all of that and consider that. So really to make a single standard is pretty difficult. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And, and th it's what I've done, you know, since I uh, really started working with the SWAT team in Phoenix, which was probably some of the best experience. We had a full-time team there, which were 52 strong. Um, at the time, there were only two ladies on there, and they were just absolute, you know, athletic studs, you know. I mean, they were mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, but we did a bunch of testing on them, and, of course, they loved it because they get to wear their really tight shirts and show off their biceps, you know. Uh, but they allowed me to kind of poke in pride and really kind of break through what I would call the true tactics, tactical strength and conditioning of what they needed, you know. And uh, we came a long way, and I came a long way as a coach just going through that. Made a little bit of an impact, changed their entire uh, uh, program, you know, or testing process, which was nice. Um, but I learned a lot, a lot there, and it's really paid forward. You know, because right now I have, I only have three military, two are, two are TDY right now. Um, but I, I try to keep mine only down to about four or five individuals because I am retired and I do this as this is kind of my passion project. Um, so I want to keep active in it. But out of that, I have three different jobs going on. One's going down the pipeline for medic. So, you know, kind of pararescue pipeline. Uh, one just went off to ranger school. He's actually starting ranger school, I think, in, in uh, a month and a half. Uh, so he's currently in the infantry school to get through there. And then one's one right now is uh, just kind of like a gas pumper, you know, uh, she pumps fuels in, into planes, you know, but, uh, you know, a great athlete. So each one's a different kind of a different outcome that we're looking for, but still under the same, they still need basic strength, you know, not just relevant, but absolute. Right. You know, so we're actually training strength training, you know, whether they're army, air force, Navy or Marines, it doesn't matter, you know, at this point, it's, it's all still all the variables that we're always looking for in an athlete. Right. Yeah, I think what you're, you know, what you just explained was the, the idea and the concept of specificity again, where, you know, we look at the army and the Marines and the, even the, the police officers and firefighters, they have a specific test, right? They have a physical test, a P test or a, you know, I guess they do have a P test as well, but a test to assess, you know, their muscular strength and endurance, right? So for the army, it's still the two minute push push-ups, two minute setups, and the two mile run. The thing is, and this was one of my major arguments to uh, the to the flight docs is, you know, we we take this test that's good for the mass, right? Your fuelers, right. your food service industry guys, your um, mechanics, and also your F-16 fighter pilots. 
So let's say you have an F-16 fighter pilot that scores like an 80% overall, but this food service specialist makes a 100%. Now, does that test, does that, you know, relative test there indicate that food service specialist would be a better pilot than the fighter pilot? And so, you know, they, they sat there and kind of scratched their head a little bit and was like, where's this guy going with it? The thing is, that's where strength and conditioning comes back into play because high G, high um, acceleration, right? Yeah. These velocities, when, when they're doing air to air combat, you know, they're basically doing a button hook with a plane. And, you know, force travels. Right. It, it doesn't just stop and turn, you know, it's got to transfer and dissipate somehow. Well, with that, that's why I would always encourage people using something like a front squat. Uh, and a deadlift just to kind of really work the, the posterior and anterior chains simultaneously to help keep that core compression and keep the intradominal you know, pressure built up. So when they're doing these high octane events, they have that injury prevention somewhat built into it. Um, and I, that's a real hot term today is injury prevention, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially like I, I was a little involved with the, um, the the new Army Fitness, AFCT, the Army Fitness Combat Test. Um, I was in early on and, and, and brought in just to kind of talk through it, so so to speak. Interesting uh, as can be, you know. They, I mean, I am so happy that they finally put a strength component in there, you know, because, it's, you know, it's relative. You know, it's relative to most of their jobs. Now, it could be argued that, you know, if you're an admin person, you're never going to have to lift 340 pounds, you know, so that's understandable. But for the masses, and they have different levels, you know, so at least talk about specificity, you know, at least there are different levels. And if you want to be, say, a, a tier one, tier two operator, um, you would have to score higher, you know, infantry and above, you know, they're in the black zone and you have to score higher. And it makes perfect sense. You know, they have to be a little bit better. So in your case, the F-16 pilot should be a little bit better than the cook. Right. And I like what you said about doing that, you know, the, uh, making sure that they go outside of their relative zone, relative strength and do some absolute strength to build even a better, you know, more sound core than, than what they can get by doing what they typically do. And that's it's crunches and, you know, planks and, and whatnot. It's not a whole lot of load there, you know, other than their body weight. So it actually, you know, you're doing a good job with that. Well, I appreciate it, but this is I know you know that, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's good to bring this up because what, what, it, it's real. It is. Know, and it's, and it's relative to what they do. And, and this is what we need to do. Because, you know, to kind of piggyback off of that, you and I are fundamentally trained and fundamentally, you know, encouraged to aspirate coaches. You know, what, what's nice is the fact that you and I have prior experience as well. So we, we've seen the, we, we've lived the lifestyle, we hear what people want to do, and we have the skill sets to make that happen. But then there's, like you were talking about, we have to create the bridge to marry the two up. Because, you know, because I am with the National Guard, I get a lot of the, you know, the senior pilots, the senior uh, guys that's either retired or getting close to retired and, and want to be stable without having PCSs all the time. And there's a couple of young bucks there too, but what I'm trying to get at is there's that preconceived notion, like how you mentioned earlier with, you know, being an athlete, then transitioning into a coach, but they don't know what periodization means or they don't, con you know, have the concept of uh, hypertrophy and muscle endurance or what, how that translates into glycolysis and how that changes your diet for the day. So there, there's a, a huge interaction among all of these energy systems that, you know, it takes a brain that's familiar with it, has lived it, and is able to apply it as opposed to taking, like me, a grunt, almost 10 years, maxed and exceeded the, uh, the standard scale, and somehow became a subject matter expert in physical training. So I got a PT certification. <laughs> uh, so what, what I like to do, and I think you can help me kind of create this content here is how do we break the habit, right? So the tactical athlete has their mindset. Uh, they're, they're typically your A-type personality. And so when we in, engage these populations and say, hey, it's great that you can run five miles in 32 minutes, 
but your sprinting sucks, right? We need to make your sprinting more powerful. You, we need to encourage acceleration and velocity so you as a firefighter can run up a flight of stairs and extract people that are in harm's way. Or if you're a police officer trying to, you know, chase somebody down, we see it all the time on the news now, before it becomes lethal, how can we make you more proficient at being non-lethal before being lethal? Yeah, that's a big can of worms right there. But it is. That's, yeah, that's a, I'll refer you out to, for, for that one. But I, <laughs> I've got a lot of people in that business doing a lot of work right now. But you're right. And again, right, specificity, you know, but we all need basics. You know, we all need basic strength. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't care what position you're in. You know, I'd say, you know, like the fire department, they need a little bit more than police. You know, they need to be a little bit stronger when we're talking about um, absolute strength in particular, um, because they're always lifting heavy items off the floor, you know, in, in particular, like uh, people, you know, I'm working with a young lady right now. She weighs 135 pounds. She just picked up a gentleman that was 235 pounds, you know? Yeah. So, all right. What do you think we're going to work on? deadlifts right yes. of course basic right basic squats strength yeah. training get the yeah, fundamentals something yeah unfortunately even though she already graduated the academy she's never touched a weight that was focused on strength training you know of course we have all sorts of fancy you know secondary movements and that's what they seem to focus on but they they forgot about the basics right. you know unfortunately so this this is nice it's, it's coming along um Military, same thing, need to lift some weights, right? Agree. I think we can all agree, any strength and conditioning coach, but maybe not. I don't need you to be as strong as, say, a fireman, firefighter, you know? So, you know, again, it comes down to the individuals. You know, what's your job? Okay, but you need to pick up a rifle at any moment, so you need these basics. You know, yeah, you might, you might be a fuel pumper right now, but, you know, right now, the one I'm referring to is TDY in a dangerous zone, mm -hmm. you know? She will have to pick up a rifle. You know, like the, I know it this time right now. The old school Marine saying everyone's a, or every Marine's a rifleman. That's right. That's you know? right. So that, yeah, whether it, you like it or not. So it makes perfect sense when you say we have to really hammer in these basics, these fundamentals. Yes. Getting yeah. these. It, to you and I, when I say a core lift, you and I both know that's some type of weight that creates a compression uh, along the spine. To right. uh, the average person. When you say core lift, they're thinking, oh, abs. Yeah. You know, yeah. Ab, you know that, that's your core, your, your right. four or five muscle ab, right. ab muscles. That, that's where you and I have to really exceed at, you know, creating the bridge again to saying, hey, you're not wrong, but there's more to it. Right. Um, so when, and that's when easy you, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but, you, you know, like you were referring to earlier, you know, it's commanders and above that, you know, need to be on board with this. And I, and I think they're much better. You know, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to disregard what they've done in the past or, you know, their, their mindset now, but I think they're, they've come a long way and people like you and I being in there every day and talking to them, closing that theoretical to the practical and closing that gap as much as we can, uh, it's making an impact for sure. And you're seeing it, you know, you're seeing, uh, uh, you know, amongst most of the command staff. And nobody's guiltier than the police. I will tell you that. <laughs> Each year, you know, every seemed like every two years, I got a new commander. You know, right. this commander was like, "Hey, I went through this academy 26 years ago. We ran five, six, seven, eight miles a day. We did push-ups, and I did a great job. I'm a commander now. You know, yeah, okay, you, you did okay. I really know what they did in, as a, as a patrol officer. You know, so but, yeah, secrets between me and you here, but maybe not as good as they thought." But they made it through their program. They made it through their career like that, you know, but they were missing a lot, you know, oh, yeah. and it just doesn't cut it anymore. You know, and there's no excuse. You see it on the news, you know, and police, of course, you're going to see them in the news more than military, right? Because military, you're overseas, first of all. Um, I hate to say this term spray and pray, you know, but uh, it's still utilized. I was a heavy armor guy. You would not. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I get it. I was simple love and bravo. So, you know, up, over the head and, you know. Hopefully. Um, but police world, you know, you're, you're responsible for each and every round, you know, that changes your, your, that changes the functionality of your weapon, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and it better, but it's the same thing that you're seeing, you know, they're, they're, they have no other choice, but to go to lethal because they've not trained anything less than that. 
they go from contact to lethal because they're, they, they did not in the, as an individual close that gap. And I say most of the time, I hate to say this about my own people, but it's because of their lack of training. Yeah. There, there are a lot of training needs as a, as a police officer. And I know this best, you know, after 25 years, but you have to fight, you know, you have to learn, you have to learn defensive tactics. You know, the more you learn, the less force you use. This is just natural, right. right? The calmer you become. So when you're ready or when they're ready, we never make the first move. Really, it's on the individual. You're ready. You know, close that gap quick. Take care of it. Get it done. You know, there's no reason to be sitting on anybody for eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. You know, you wouldn't see anything like that. And properly, not just that, but, the, you know, of course, the mental aspect of that. Like I said earlier, you know, the, the confidence of just having that behind you, you know. Could you lose? Well, yeah, absolutely, of course, you know. They, you know, it's kind of their fight. They, they choose what they want to do. You know, See, we, we kind of have to react. side of the job. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, a lot of it can be solved with proper training. And that includes our component, not just the mental you know, because there's a lot of cognitive work that's going on. Um, we've got some great stuff going on at Phoenix Police right now, you know, where they're actually cognitively training folks, mm -hmm. you know, for decision makers better than we've ever done before. So I can't wait for that study to come out. It's supposed to be due this year and in, in, during the summer. So I'm looking forward to seeing things like this. But back to our section, uh, it takes it all, you know, good human performance program. Absolutely. You know, really. And we are a major component of that. Right on. Yeah, yeah. And we're finally come. You know, we're finally getting there, though. You know, that's good. I, I I was never even invited to these meetings. You know, when I first got on, you know, in, into the into the coaching aspect. You know, they wouldn't even allow me in the meetings. I'm like, well, it, it's all relative. You know, like I should be talking to the fire for right. firearms. You know, because that task that goes hand in hand. I should be talking Absolutely. to the defensive tactics because what are their needs? You know, and I have to say that they're actually doing a really good job there as well. Because we got that understanding, you know, we have, we know that, you know, firearms, defensive tactics, and the physical fitness, that's all one. Oh, you yeah. guys are on the same team. It, it's all about being holistic at that point and trying exactly. to, create, you know, taking a marketing stance, that's how you create a better product overall. Right. And when we consider tactical athletes, right, again, there's that preface tactical where you always, the assumptions laid on the grunt. It's laid on right. the, the, you know, your, your guy that's on patrol and it's laid on, uh, your, your firefighter that's rolling up on a five alarm. Uh, and so that when, when we talk about it, you and I, cause again, we are both former grunts. We're both strength conditioning professionals. Now that's part of the plan that, you know, shoot, move, communicate, kill. That was, that's the, right. that was yeah. the catchphrase, wasn't it? So shoot. Yeah. That, we want to make sure that when you're advancing, it's somewhat safe or, you know, there's a, a smaller chance. So you have Bravo team start suppression, alpha team advance 25 yards. That 25 yards has to translate into a full on sprint. Mm -hmm. you know? And during that same time, you're not dropping your weapon. You're not putting the low ready. You're still got the three eyes. You got that trifecta still rolling. And so I like how you mentioned keeping a cooler head because my first platoon sergeant, I look up to him today, right? We, we always kept on, kept in communication through Facebook and through other social media. And once a year, we, we do the Memorial Day service. And a lot of times he and I show up at the same, throughout the same years. He always preached cooler heads prevailed. Yeah, man. And the only way that we could develop that cool head was through the being confident in our strength training, in our training, in our you know, that holistic approach of taking the, you know, integrating PT with weapons, right? We were the only guys in Germany running around downtown Frank or Freeburg with our tactical gear on, our flak vests, our K-pots, our, our weapons kit, jumping up on buildings, pulling security, jumping off buildings, doing the team. And so that was a, a real eye-opening, you know, concept for me for being a small town boy, first of all. But second of all, it became a real skill that I can leverage now. That's something that I can look back on as an experience that I took as a tactical athlete, build that into the, the practice that I'm doing now. Because like you said, it's more than just strength conditioning. It's more than just 
trying to keep these departments separated from each other because there's got to be crosstalk. There's got to be uh, a, a common theme among what strength and conditioning does with firearms, with firearm training, with search and rescue, and it's got to fit together. And that takes the commander to look out and say, all right, we've got all these assets. I can tell them what to do because I'm their commander, or I can have them learn from each other and learn how to interact with each other and learn how those assets are assets and not liabilities. So I like that. I like the way how you brought that up, and I like the way how you explained it. You know, simple terms. You know, it's something I struggle with today, you know, with uh, searching for my PhD, too, and my, my vernacular is kind of up there. It, it helps me to talk to guys like you that have that practical sense and know how to translate it. So Yeah, which is sadly why I don't have a PhD, right? Well, <laughs> it's good. It's good no, that we yeah. have guys that are like that. Uh, yeah. So when we're talking about holistics and being in a being in a team, the at, with the National Guard, it's more along the lines of still being a civilian and contacting other treatment facilities out in the city as opposed to having someone that's in-house. So what, how, is, how is your relationship with physical therapists and ATCs? Uh, because I, I know that there's a confusion. There, there's, like, when, again, when I explain being a physical therapist, or not a physical therapist, but as an ex-physiologist, the first question I get asked, oh, so you're like a PT. I'm like, right. Yeah. Not quite. Uh, I think they confuse it with personal trainer, PT. Maybe. You know? Yeah. I, I, I've, I've heard that before. And I'm like, you yeah, know, don't call me either because I haven't earned either, really, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, PTs. Yeah. I, such a critical component, you know? Um, the way I look at it is we're all in charge. You know, I kind of bring it back when I have these meetings with them. I'm like, hey, man, let's just think like a cop right now. You are the case agent. You are the case agent of this crime. The crime has been committed on this person. That crime is a blown out MCL. You know, however it happened, that's a crime. You're the case agent. You're in charge of that. You take that on 100%. That is yours right now. You just took that from me. That's yours 100%. When you're ready to release, you know, then it's mine. Now I am the case agent. So I take from, you know, the post-op yeah, through PT, and then I take them on as an athlete, so to speak, but we're all in the game. So that report doesn't touch one person, but we pass on and we communicate the entire time. So we act as a team, even though that person at that time is a case agent. Um, we all, we're all in the know. We all know where they are at that time. <clears throat> we know what to expect time-wise. And we also know what to expect, kind of, especially if we had them before they blew it out, where they need to be on the, on the backside at the end of this, you know. So uh, we do our best to communicate on a regular basis for each one that goes in and each one that comes out. Um, I take it a little bit different. So if they've got injured either during sport or in our case, you know, tactics. So uh, one jumped out of a plane, you know. Blow out his MTL, well, he's mine, you know, because I consider that a sport, you know, in the sports world. You know, in our world, that's that's our sport, right? Mm -hmm. On his landing, you know, he hit it wrong, you know, not his fault, hit a rock, you know, things like this happen, blew it out, and going through the process, walk him through, but he's mine. So I, in that case, I'm the case agent, and I walk him through all of the processes until he's back to me, and then he's mine. You know, so I think we have to take each individual candidate, officer, firefighter, uh, TAC athlete, to what I would just say is a TAC athlete across the board, as you, as though you're the case agent, they're yours. And I think it, it, you know, you have to earn that respect with the PTs and ATs. So once you get that, um, it, it goes a long way. And I, I will, t uh, you know, be completely honest. I mean, I had that in, in Phoenix prior to leaving. Because I had, we had a, a fantastic uh, group there. This is still building because of COVID. We've not really had that process. It's not yet seamless, but it will be. It will be. I mean, once this clears up, I mean, you know, we're already starting to kind of see the end of it. So it, it will be a, a much more, a much easier flow through the entire process. But I'm in touch with each one of them. Regardless, good. Listen. It's pretty simple now. I don't have as many athletes as you have. Uh, texting, you know, these new phones are so cool, right? The smartphones, how, oh man, that things have changed. You know, it used to have to be like they would have to physically call you on a landline to figure out how they're doing, you know? So it's so much easier to communicate with your athletes. As a matter of fact, 
I was texting one this morning who's in, uh, well, they're in the Middle East. I uh, well, can't say exactly where, but, uh, you know, we're, we're still communicating, you know, still, hey, here's your training program. You know, don't slack off just because you don't have, you know, 800 pounds worth of weight. You got a lot of sand over there and this I know, you know, so uh, yeah, put it in a bag and lift it, you know. So, uh, yeah, just it, it's pretty cool with the current technology. That's, that's really helped. Boy, I went around the corner to cross the street there and I know that, but uh, but it, but it's all encompassing, you know. Right on. Um, so I guess one last question on that topic. Sure. Uh, and you, you could probably help explain it better than I can. So that's why I got to ask is where's that line? Where does it end when you you're, you're training a SWAT team member blows out his MCL, then he goes to see a, a PT. You know, that's a clear line of, uh, yeah. you know, scope of practice there. But when, at what point does that transition begin and occur? You know, where's that overlap and where's that fine line that he goes from actual therapy to back to uh, strength conditioning and, you know, advancing his physiological response? This is a great question, man. And I'll tell you, to be honest, this, this took us probably about a year and a half to de- not just develop, but actually just kind of get started, develop and then implement it. And then kind of go back and make sure, you know, we pressure tested it. Um, I worked with a, a fantastic PT company called Tops over in Phoenix, Arizona. Best around. That, that's all to it. But what they did was they, they supplied me with a couple of interns. So what we started doing was I shadowed them. I went to their facility. I shadowed them, kind of watched the process, talked through it a little bit. And then they came down to the police academy and shadowed me. And so what we needed them to be. So it was closing the gap between, I have no idea what a SWAT guy does, you know, in physical therapy, I know where I need to get them, but I have no idea really, you know, I've seen SWAT on TV, but come on, is that real? Right. So <laughs> I guess they all have to look like that one dude, whoever it is, but uh, you know, not the case. Right. So it is all about closing that gap and the more education we give them and provide them by doing shadows. Um, they even started doing ride alongs with our actual SWAT officers they would come out and they would actually watch the PT program. Uh, they would come out and watch the testing. They would come out and watch the recruitment. It kind of takes that. It's a, 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 a holistic approach, of course, you know, but uh, kind of takes a little give and go from both sides. You know, we also had to be there. So we had to develop, all right, they are, what is their, what we call back to 10 you know, back to, back to service. What does it take? And we came up with an entire list of things that I wanted to see from the therapist before they were fully released back to the team or back to service. And uh, it was, it was, you know, we, we figured it out as we went along, you know, we continued to, to uh, develop it and implement it. And until the point that we got it pretty close to not perfected, there's no such thing, you know, but pretty good for a human, you know, because of all the variables, you know, the ones that we just can't, can't, uh, can't, we, we, we just never know, you know, but it took a long time. It's a lot of work, but, uh, you know, you, you have the basics, you know, where they need to be. They know how they're doing in therapy, but how can we share our experience and say, no, I need them to do this. I need them to be able to jump over a six foot wall with 80 pounds on their pack, uh, on their back. You know, if they can't do that, they're not ready to come out yet. You know, and it it, it could be, a, a, of course, you know, a lot more detailed than that or a little less. Uh, but there's got to be some type of standard there. And right on, yeah. That, I guess that just kind of grounds it back to the the idea of working as a, a group as opposed to being an individual. Yeah. And, then, and I have to say, and the, the, the Army's doing a great job at this now. You know, even for the masses, yeah, I know they're not quite out there, but, you know, my old division, 10th Mountain, um, they, man, they've got RDs, they have strength and conditioning, you know, they're really, they're doing a great job, you know, uh, you get third ranger battalion, 70, 75th in general doing a great job, right? Of course, SF, you know, they, they're hit and miss, man, those poor guys, you know, but uh, <laughs> you never know about them. Um, but, I mean, they're really doing a much, much better job. So we'll come a long way. And I think in the next five years, man, it's it's, it's going to explode and we're just going to be so relative in their world. And it's with these type of conversations that are going to get us there. Absolutely. You know? And I'm going to share this, you know, with, with a good friend of mine that happens to be a colonel over at SOCOM, you know, SF guy, very instrumental, you know, and we're always talking about what can we do next? What can we do next? And this is part of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier, there's no real expert in this yeah. field yet. And yeah. I, the way how it's going, because you got contracts in one thing, contracts in another, and you have perspectives here, perspectives there. And like my, my strength and conditioning contract was written a little bit more like a physical therapist and, but with strength and conditioning words and verbs and action, you know, words that ultimately I was more on the prehabilitation and that's another conversation to have is the difference between mm -hmm. injury prevention and prehab. But that's uh, really what I turned into being was more of keeping guys in the air rather than making them become like setting in that mindset, that sports psychology of being an actual athlete. So again, there's no real crosstalk between professionals right now because mm -hmm. you have one group that's bidding on contracts. So they want proprietary uh, information. You have another group over here that's developing proprietary information. And they're not yeah. wanting to communicate because again, it's a blue, blowing up field right now. So yep. everybody wants to be the expert and everybody wants to have that uh, reputation behind it. But right now it, it, it's great, but there's, it's also in that same notion kind of hurting everybody because we can't have communications between organizations. However, organizations like us, we can. So that's where I think you and I will, you know, I, I say that we're standing on the precipice of it. That's kind of the, I agree. the, the, the area of research what, with Dr. Brandon, uh, keep saying Roth because I know a guy named Brandon Roth, but that's not his last name. But uh, the idea of him doing the research and looking at the gender differences and looking at the differences in uh, uh, energy systems between exercises and how it correlates to the old school framework of uh, physical training to the new school physical training. And then you have, uh, you know, Andy Galpin, if you've ever heard of him, Dr. Andy Galpin, who's also working on, and it's not military related, but he, he's really furthering the, the body of knowledge in hyperplasia to in muscle, muscle tissue and working on the epigenetic shift from, like you talked about, the, the, uh, the guys who run the uh, ectomorph that is built to run can transition into a more power-based individual by developing, uh, by taking those type 1 fibers and shifting them. Like your, your body will start thinking that they are type 2X fibers or type 2A fibers, and they will literally grow, they will grow beyond what your typical type 1 fiber can do. So I appreciate your time. Uh, man, we could keep going on and on because I- I know, I'm I want to the surface. And I, we've got, because I have a whole nother hour on wanting to talk about periodization and how you know, the, the textbook says this about periodization. Yeah. yeah. As, a, as a traditional sports coach, this is periodization. As a tactical guy, this is periodization. And that's right. That's exactly what it looks like. Yep. <laughs> so it's, it, yeah. there's very little, and that's why we have words like undulating yes. uh, or nonlinear that kind of like, maybe yeah. we could call it that. Maybe we can. Right. This is how I solve for this. And I, you know, I just had this conversation with an intern as she was shadowing me the other day. I'm like, this is how it is in our world. You know, as a police officer, you get off at two o'clock in the morning, you have court at, at 7.30, but you have training, physical training at 10 o'clock with me. Consider that right there. So we come in, we have an ABC plan. You know, A plan is they're optimal. They're ready to go. They did, man, they got a great night's sleep. They're hydrated, well-nourished. You know, they're, they're ready to go. That's A plan. Well, then let's hit it. You know, then we can stick with a quasi-periodization program. But the second they lose one of those components, you know, we're switching to our B plan, you know, and, you know, it's a hard day when they have to switch to the C plan, but they're still in there. So it's not optimizing their, their performance maybe that day, but you know what, the next session will catch up and it's a long-term goal. You can't give up on these guys, you know, and I say guys, gender neutral there. You can't keep up, keep, uh, give up on our folks, you know, but you better have as a coach, ABC plan. You know, I've seen way too many gung ho, and we have one right now. Um, young intern, just pure A. Well, if you can't do that, you shouldn't be here. Well, no, you know, <laughs> and and we get paid, you know, where by the individual. So you know, we're 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 going to do the best we can without breaking them. You know, we have to make them durable forever. 
They don't. A plans don't always work. That's it. So that's how I explain it to, to a lot of the younger folks coming up. You better have three plans for sure. And again, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, man. Time. Yeah. But we'll spend an hour on that one. Yeah. <laughs> and that also, you know, details into my last thought. I have to say the last thought because we will keep talking. Yeah. Um, yep. Is burnout. You know, when we talk about the periodization programs and the, the lifestyles of tactical athletes are not the same as traditional right. athletes because yep. they, they're living their job. They're doing it day in and day out. And everything that's exercise related just adds to it. There's that's hardly right. ever any, you know, I, I love this conversation when I had an interview not too terribly long ago, but they were like, so when you're talking about a guy in the infantry, what would you consider his preseason or his off season? Or I'm like, oh, can, before you finish that question, there's none of that. All right. It's all in season. Mm -hmm. Maybe all the time. Maybe a two week off season, but it's all in season when it comes to TAC athletes. And so yep. we have to look at burnout as a major, major, major criteria for the, these programs that. You know, we got to make them tougher, stronger, faster, and more durable, but we can't burn them out. Right. Deloading, baby. That's it. That's a concept that we need to learn. We need to learn. You know, I'm an old man, and I feel pretty good for, you know, a really, really old guy. You know, uh, through the yesterday, four hours of mountain biking, you know, and yeah, I'm a little beat down today. Guess what I did this morning on my training session? I took a deloading day. You know, old man can't do it two days in a row like I used to, but you know what? I can still do it optimize my C plan, you know, got it done. And you know, by Wednesday, I'll be ready for my A plan again, you know? So these are the things that young coaches need to need to recognize. So I hope they're listening to you listening through this and uh, pick up on that fact. Yeah, great. And one Andy, before you go look up bond university, B O N D doing a lot of good tack work for, for publishing stuff. So B O N D. I'll Get check some that credit out. there. Okay. Um, all right, Mike, I do appreciate it. I do need to give you the disclaimer before you and I sign off, but that's that's not for everybody else that's listening. Again, throw, throw your, uh, your nickel pitch one last time, and hopefully people will get in contact with you. All right. Well, I'm over at uh, – my name's Mike Yatsko over at the ta uh, <laughs> Tactical Tampa Sports Academy, and I am the director of the Tactical Athlete Performance Division. We work with everybody – my battery's just about to die. We work with uh, anybody in the TAC profession, and it doesn't mean a TAC officer. It just a tactical athlete. We consider it all. Like I said, dispatchers, EMS, paramedics, firefighters, police, and, of course, military. Come on down. Give us a shot. Uh, first session's free with me, and hopefully you uh, come on board, and we'll, we'll take you on, and I promise to optimize your time. This isn't a question. It's more of a like a – a tidbit of thought. Why not life lifesavers? Is that right? Is that what they're called? The um, Baywatch, the, those guys? Oh, you know, it's not something uh, I have to be honest, it's not something I thought of, to be honest with you. I don't, I think they're individual contractors here. I'm not sure. Um, but we don't have it. This is not LA. Right. So we don't have, you know, we don't have that. And of course, yeah, they have, have their own division. So professional <laughs> I guys. I wouldn't turn them away. You know, sure. I think. Um, I've been tasked with others and I turn them away because they're not a TAC officer or a TAC athlete. And I really, you know, if you want to be a football player, I'll send you over to our football co coach. It's not that I don't have an interest. It's just, I have a specificity. I'm going to stick it in, stick at it and, uh, continue to do so. All right. Well, I appreciate it again, Mike. Uh, All right, Andy. hope people will get in contact with you and we'll be definitely in touch with the next, uh, periodization. Yeah, it'll uh, be fun. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. We'll blow it up. <laughs>